My, for, for about 30 years, we've been interested to try and understand how the body is organized. What is the genetic um, control? Which are the genes and how do they work? Oh, Marianne, I'm sorry, I don't have a pointer. Oops. Um, Oh, yes. gracias, super. Which, which are the genes, how do they work, that organize these patterns? Why do we have vertebrae in the upper part, in the cervical region, which are different from vertebrae in the lumbar region? Why do we have structures here, which are different from the structures which emerge um, in the lumbar region? Why are the limbs always built on the same scheme, that is one bone, two bones, and series of bones? What are the genetic controls? Now, of course, there are many, many genes involved in this. And amongst these genes, there's one family which we like in particular, this family that uh, Marianne uh, mentioned, these are the Hox genes. These are 39 genes which are grouped into four different complementation groups. That is, four different little groups on different chromosomes. And these genes act by combination. Combinations of proteins instruct about the structures. Now, um, these genes are regulated following a very peculiar property, which is referred to as cholinearity, which Mayan mentioned, and which says that the time and the place, oh, super thanks, thank you. The time and the place where these genes are activated during development is determined by their position in this little cluster. Okay? So this gene starts and it will work in the very anterior part. And then a little bit later, the second gene starts and the third and the fourth and the fifth, along with the development of the body, and that leads to combination that fix the structures. Okay, so this is summarized here, where you see that this gene is activated here, this one, this one, this one, this one, as if there was a sort of a little image, a genetic image of the axis written on the chromosome. Okay, now for many years, we've tried to understand how that works. How is it possible to translate a genetic topology into morphologies? Okay. Now, this is a very, very complex question when it has to do with the trunk. For reasons which you may understand, it's difficult to access, there's very few cells, extremely complex to run biochemistry. But it happens that this system was actually co-opted in the course of evolution at the time when the limb emerged, about 350 million years ago, when animal acquired limbs then the system was taken to do in the limb exactly the same thing as it does in the trunk. So you see here that there are genes on this side working on this part here and genes on that side working on this part. Okay? Now let me show you how it looks like when you look at early developing limbs. So here you see little limb buds. Okay? And you see that the Hox genes, which are on that side of the cluster, here, they are used to build this part of the limb. The stylopodium and the zygopodium, the, for, the arm and the forearm. Okay? And then there is another group of genes, which is slightly more distal here. And these genes are used to build the distal part of the limb, the hands and the feet. Okay? So, if you look at your limbs, if you look at your arm, you sort of see here the DNA molecule with genes on this side, which you know, pattern and organize this part, and genes on that side that pattern and organize this side. It's a very enigmatic um, process. And the question is, how does that work? So what I'd like to do this morning is to tell you straight how we think it works. 
to just make it clear. And then I'll come back to some uh, experimental details. I think it's easier this way. So if you look at this piece of DNA, it's about 100 kilobase large. It's, you find one gene every 10 kilobase. It's packed. It's probably the region of the genome, the human, the mouse genome, that has the highest density of genes. Okay? So if you zoom out, and now you look at a several megabase landscape, so what you see here, this cluster, now you see it here. Here. Okay? You see that this little group of genes is flanked by two large um, sort of balls of chromatin DNA, okay? And these large chromatin balls are filled with regulatory elements, enhancer elements, elements that can control the activity of these genes, okay? So early on during development, this particular chromatin ball here, which you can see here, works, is switched on. All the enhancers are active. And these enhancers are firing on the genes which are on this side of the cluster. Okay? This is at the time the, the early limb bud grows. In the embryo, you have the, the early limb bud starting to grow, to grow, to grow. And these enhancers are working and they fire on these genes. Okay? The result is that these genes produce proteins. These proteins organize these patterns here. Do I do that or? Okay. <laughs> okay. Then, a few hours later, in the most distal cells of the limb here, under the influence of factors which are released by the ectodermal layer here, this particular chromatin ball is switched off and this one is switched on. Okay. So you have now these enhancers here, those which are in this place here, which are starting to fire and they fire on these genes here. And the enhancers which are on this chromatin ball here are switched off. You, you see how it works? So you have to imagine these two, these sort of two chromatin domains. Early on, this one works. And this one is, is silent. Okay, this one works. It works, it works. On these genes on these sides, and it makes this part, okay, like, like this. Okay. And then, a few hours later, this one starts to work. And the genes go, puff, and this one stops. Okay? And this is why you get this, this uh, um, you know, uh, distribu this. So distribution, this asymmetric distribution of the uh, gene expression, because first you start on this side, then you go on that side. First you make this, then you make this. Okay? Now, you can use biochemical tools to see these um, chromatin balls here. And uh, to make it simple, you can um, sort of quantify the number of interaction, you see here, everything is sort of touching, uh, touching, you know, the chromatin is in close contact. You can actually quantify this contact by a methodology which is called 3C, 4C, 5C, whatever, high C, it's a C's technology for chromosome conformation capture. If you do this, this is what you see. The little gene cluster is here in blue, and you see this triangle, these pyramids, these pyramids do actually correspond to this chromatin domain. These pyramids illustrate regions where there are high numbers of contacts. Okay? The more red it is, the more contacts you have. For example, you see this point here? It means there's a strong contact between this piece of DNA here and these genes here. Strong contact. Okay? So you see these two chromatin um, domain, which we call topologically associating domains or TADs. Okay, this is what we call TADs. Okay, now, I told you this particular TAD here 
is actually working in the forearm, and, uh, in the digit, and this particular tad here is working in the forearm. How do we know that? Well, there are many pieces of evidence. Let me show you the one I like the best. I think it's the simplest one, and that makes the point. You can produce a mouse with a targeted inversion, you just invert a piece of DNA, as it occurs frequently in, in patients, in, in families, in fact. You invert a piece of DNA, you target the inversion right near this particular gene here, number 13, okay? So what you do is you take this regulatory domain here, this TAD, and you send it very far away, megabase away, at a distance that it can no longer contact the target genes. Okay? If you do this, you see that you lose expression in the distal part. Of course, because you no longer have the enhancers for distal expression. So now the little limb bud has lost the expression of these genes in this part. But you see that expression remains in the proximal part because proximal enhancers are located there. Okay? How do we know that? Well, you can do the opposite inversion. You can now produce a mouse where you send this particular region very far away, megabase away. And if you do this, you now see that you keep expression in the distal part, of course, because now you have this. But you lose expression in the proximal part. Okay? So it is a bimodal system, very simple system. It's, it's disappointingly simple, in, in fact, after all these years of work. Okay. It works like this. Here you have enhancer sequences for distal cells. Here you have enhancer sequences for proximal cells. If you mix the two, you get the picture I showed you in the beginning. Proximal here, distal here. But look, there is a slight bands of cells here which are negative for both. The cell, in these cells, you don't get expression of any Hox genes. Okay? The reason is why? Well, because these cells give rise to the wrist, to the articulation. Okay? So how, how is that possible? Well, because it's been shown by many groups, and, and uh, in fact, Marianne Ross has been working very hard on this, um, that these genes, the proteins, are used to stimulate bone elongation. They're expressed in the perichondrium. So the more Hox genes you have, the more the bone will elongate. If you have a part that is lacking Hox genes, the cartilage matrix will not elongate. It will stay like miserable, roundish bones, that's the wrist, it's the articulation, okay? So the system is quite smart, in fact, because at the time it produced the hands and the feet, the same mechanism produced the articulation, which makes sense, because, you know, if you would produce a hand with, without articulation, there's no ad adapt adaptive advantage, you know, you, it, it doesn't help. So the, the method which was selected, the mechanism which was selected, is a mechanism that can do both things. Okay? Now, if you look at these chromatin domains, you notice something that is extremely striking, which is that you get a lot of contacts here, you get a lot of contacts here, but look, you you get very, very few contacts between the two tads, as if there was a sort of a wall, a boundary, okay? You get this chromatin working here, this chromatin working here, but you never get contacts between the two, okay? Now, you can use these contact points to isolate regulatory sequences. For example, Look at this strong square here. This is number 13, which contact this green box here. This is an enhancer sequence. You can take this green box, go into 
a transgenic assay, and this is the work of Chase Bolt, a postdoc in the lab, and you see this extraordinary specific expression of the transgene, okay? These are enhancer sequences that are very specific to make the hands and the feet, okay? So let me come back to this point. Why don't we get any contact between these two tabs? Okay. Um, you can see that with your eyes, in fact, by labeling these tads with series of back clones. You can take large pieces of DNA, 200 kilobase, 300 kilobase, label them entirely, and look in, in fish with microscopy. This is what you see. You see? This is the two tads. And in green here, the Hogs D cluster is labeled. So you see here the mix of the three, the two tads, and the cluster in between. Okay. Now, this is direct microscopy. It doesn't really show you the shape, but you can go to ultra sensitive microscopy like SIM. And if you do this, this is the work of Pierre Fabre, a postdoc in the lab. You see these two domains. And again, you see that there is no contact. It's no, you, you know, you, you would expect that somehow they would mix at some point, but they never do. They, they stay separate from one another. Okay? So it really seems that there is a boundary here. If you look at the exact position of this boundary, you find it right between gene number 11 and gene number 12. That is, between all the genes that work in the forearm and the two genes that work in the hand. You see? Forearm, forearm, forearm. No forearm, no forearm. So this boundary seems to be there in a way to prevent these enhancers to cross and touch these genes. Okay? So let me try to answer to two questions. The first one is, what is the nature of this boundary? What makes it that prevents these enhancers to touch these genes? You, you, you see the problem. You get five, six strong enhancers a megabase away from 10 promoters, 10 genes which are packed. And the, all this mess, these, these enhancers, selectively contact the, all the genes but the last two. How is it possible? How can these two genes can avoid to be contacted? Now, it's quite complex, but to make it simple, if you focus, if you focus on this region, on this boundary region, you see that it is filled with bound, a bound protein that is called CTCF, which is a protein that is known for its potential to organize the architecture of the genome. It's what we call an architectural protein. It's, you know, it's usually a constitutive protein, which is used to, along with the cohesin to give the shape to, to chromatin domains, okay? Now, if you look exactly at this position, you see that there is, again, one of the highest concentration of CTCF, of bound CTCF site at this position. If you zoom in this region here, if you zoom in, you see all the CTCF, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, 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 10, okay, huge concentration of CTCF, which um, have different orientation. All these sites, but one, they look towards this direction, okay? All these sites, these four sites, they look towards this direction. In between, again, you get this boundary between gene number 11 and gene number 12. Now, that fits with a recent model, which is called the loop extrusion model, and Again, I don't want to go too much into the details. It was proposed by uh, Erez uh, Lieberman and Leonid Mirny. And the idea is that when you have CTCF sites which look 
watch one another in opposite orientation, you make a loop. You make a loop of chromatin. Okay? So, the idea in this case is that you would have a huge loop going this way to the enhancers on that side because of this, all these CDCF sites looking that side. And there would be a huge loop going that way to other enhancers because all the sites are looking this, this side. Okay? You see the, the... So you would have these two domains. And the reason why these two domains would be separated is because the loop that they form, they are blocked by the CTCF sites on that side and on this side. Okay? There are, of course, obvious experiments to do to verify this, and we're doing them, which is to mutate these sites, to invert these sites, to see if you can change the orientation of the loop, etc. That will take a, a long time. Okay. Now, is this boundary biologically relevant? Is it helpful? Does it do something? Is it necessary to have this boundary between these two tads? Or is this just something that we observe with, without any importance? And here, I'd like to show you the last complicated slide. Um, so let me tell you up front the, the conclusion, so don't, don't be afraid. Um, what we can do is to take this region here and start to remove pieces of it. Now, the way we do this is for the past 20 years in the lab, we have designed genetic tools, genetic approaches, which are feasible in, in mammals, in the mouse, to delete, duplicate, invert, all kind of you know, genes and so. So for example, we have mice which have a deletion of gene number eight or a deletion of gene number eight and nine or a duplication of gene number 11. We keep these stocks, okay? That, okay. So what we can do is say the following thing. Well, let's take a mouse that would have a deletion of this part here, for example, okay? And see if the boundary stays at the same position or if it shifts to the left or if it shifts to the right and so on, okay? So we've done that with many of these deletions. And I'd like to show you on the next slide what is the general result that we see, okay? So it's a complicated slide, but this is the cluster. You see these holes here? The holes are actually the deletion, the piece we have, which we have removed, okay? And what you see here is the contact. It's a work done by Edgardo Rodriguez Carballo in the lab. It's a contact which are established from this point here, this enhancer, this enhancer, to the cluster. So what we do is we fix, let's, let's assume you are the enhancer here. You are an enhancer that works in the forearm, okay? And the question is, what can I grab? What can I touch, okay? In the wild type situation, you see you can touch the cluster, the target genes here, but you cannot touch the last two genes, as I showed you, number 12, number 13, okay? It's blocked, you, you hit a wall. Okay. Now, when you start removing pieces, immediately you see these peaks here. Peaks, peaks, peaks. This is gene number 13. So when you start removing part of the border, now you can grab number 13. Okay? So this boundary is used to prevent the last gene of the cluster to be touched by these enhancers here. Okay? Why? Why should, it, why, why should that occur? Why, why bothering for this? The reason is that gene number 13 is the last gene of the cluster. That's the end. And the information that this gene gives is, you know, game over. That's the end. So it's a gene, it makes a protein 
that terminates the system. It terminates the rashes, it terminates the spine, it terminates the intestine, it makes the anal sphincter, in fact, it terminates the external genitals, and it terminates the limbs. It's a terminator. Okay? Now, the way it terminates things is a very clever way. It competes with the action of all other Hox genes. It's what we call in uh, uh, human genetics a dominant negative. Okay, so you have any kind of Hox genes that is doing his job, making a bone or whatever. If you co-express the last gene, number 13, it stops. We don't understand fully how it does that, but it clearly is a dominant negative. Okay? So, of course, you don't want this gene that is a terminator to be expressed at the time you make the forearm. Because if you do that, you will mess the formation of the forearm. Okay? So this is why you get this strong boundary here. You prevent number 13 to react. Okay? Can we demonstrate this? Yes, we have several alleles. We produce several mice that demonstrate that this is correct, actually. And I show you one, which is one of the first mutants we ever produced. It was in 1996. And at that time, of course, we did not understand what we were seeing. But in retrospect, it was so clear. So this is a mouse that I don't even tell you how, but this is number 13, normal, you know, only in digits, okay? This is the mutant. You see number 13 in digits, but in addition, you see number 13 in the forearm, okay? in a place where it should not be, okay? This is quite similar to what you would get if you would remove the boundary. If you remove the boundary, now the proximal enhancers, forearm enhancers, touch 13, and you activate 13 here, okay? If you produce 13 in the forearm, you affect the function of gene number 10 and 11, which are building the forearm, and you get this strong mesomelic dysplasia here. It's a mesomelia, it's a shortening of the bone, and it's a dysplasia because the bones are, are bent. Okay, it's a mesomelic dysplasia. Okay, if you put more 13 here, you get stronger. If you get equal amount of 13 here, that you have here, you essentially get no forearm. You will get the hands stick to, to the shoulder, okay? Now, this phenotype here, if there are human geneticists in the room, it's a very common phenotype in human. It's many, many human families which have mesomelic dysplasias. And a large percentage of these mesomelic dysplasias are due to problem in 2Q31, that is the chromosomic region in human that is the synthetic region to the human chromosome 2, is the Hox D cluster. I'll show you here an example. This is a very interesting um, uh, case. This little girl, she is suffering from a duplication of the gene cluster and inversion. So, the cluster is duplicated in cis, inverted. The result is that 13 now is on the wrong side. It responds to the forearm enhancers. And this is why this girl developed this very strong mesomelic dysplasia. Okay? Now, interestingly, what, what is considered here as being a very severe condition for a human family is actually an extraordinary good adaptive value for other animals. I mean, this animal doesn't suffer from mesomelic dysplasia. It has a, 
intrinsic mesomelic dysplasia, which helps to, to swim in water. Okay. So, what I mean by this is that um, by understanding the mechanism that build, that regulate these genes, you can not only understand what happens in human genetic syndromes, but you can understand that by slightly changing the position of this boundary, you can lead to conditions that have an adaptive values in animals. Okay. Now, of course, it would be very interesting for us to try and get embryos from, from these animals, but it's no way. It's absolutely you know, impossible. And um, I, I regret that because I'm sure that this boundary, we would find this boundary position in a slightly different, a slightly different place. Now, if you understood what I said, then you must now understand how is the general logic of the system, okay? And if you start asking the question, are there other enhancers in these two TADs, in these two chromatin domains, others than limb enhancers? The answer is yes. In fact, these Hox proteins, they are very generic. They are very poorly specific. They have a DNA binding motif, a homeobox, homeodomain, which is not interesting. It binds everywhere. Okay, so they can be used and reused and reused for anything. You know, it's not like it's a sort of a surgical protein that finds the... No, it's, they work by large combinations. So each time vertebrates, mammals, evolved something new, like mammary glands, hairs, uh, you know, maxillaries, whatever, they went, evolution went into this hox stuff and evolved new enhancers to recruit part of the system. But the interesting question is, where are, the, where are these enhancers? And this is what you see. If you look at this tad here, so this is the Hox cluster. Here is one tad, one chromatin domain. Here is one chromatin domain. If you look here, in the place you have forearm enhancers. Look, you see, limbs, sacrum, intestine, kidneys, testis, mammary gland, whiskers, crest cells, etc., etc. The more we look, the more we find. Each time vertebrate evolved a new trait, they sort of went to the Hox system and evolved new enhancers. Okay, look at here. Digits, genitals, digit, genitals, genitals, digit, digit, genitals. It's 25 years. We're looking for enhancers in this tad here. We never found anything else than digits and external genitals. Why? Because that's the end. That's the end of the system. Okay? So if you would introduce any of these enhancers here, you kill the system. Okay? Because if you get gene number 13 in kidneys, no kidney, in crest cells, no crest cells, in mammary glands, no mammary glands. So all the enhancers had to accumulate on the other, on the other hand. And on this part here, you only find the terminators. Okay? So the last thing I'd like to show you is the system is very sensitive. So you must prevent number 13 to be attacked by these enhancers. It's a matter of life, of survival for the animal. Okay? So the system is using two safety mechanisms. The first safety mechanism is the one I showed you. You build this wall of proteins, of CTCF, you build this big boundary that prevents these enhancers to, to reach 13 because there's a huge loop on this side. Okay? And the second safety mechanism is that 13 here is constantly trapped by the other chromatin domain. Okay? It's blocked here, so it, it cannot access the other side. So um, Fabrice Darbelet, a pre-doc in the lab, decided to, well, what, what would happen if we would 
the sequester 13. 13 is always stuck on this part, okay? What happens if we remove the sequences that, st that stuck 13? We remove this sequence. Now 13 is free. Will it go to the other side? And if it goes to the other side, what happens? Okay? So the experiment is quite simple. This is again the cluster here. 13, you see 13 is always, con always contact this part here. 70% of the contacts are there. Okay? So what you can do now is to use the inversion allele with, which I showed you in the beginning of my talk. Okay? What you do is you invert this piece of DNA here. Okay? Let's imagine you have the chromatin here. 13 is stuck here. Okay? What you do is you take this part here and you invert. So 13 no longer has the sequence. Okay? So what, so what happens to 13? And interestingly, you see that right, it's, it's difficult to see because, I mean, if you're not really in, into this. But you see that 13 still contacts the new DNA that comes. DNA that number 13 has not seen for the past 500 million years. It's a new DNA that comes, okay? But it contacts. And we think that the reason why it contacts is because there is this wall, these boundaries, which pushes 13. It, it has to be on that side, okay? But you see that it gains 15% contact on the other side, okay? So, you get 13 here. You remove this piece of DNA, 15% of the contact now are on the other side. So it means that 13 can be contacted by the other enhancers, but only very slightly, a gain of 15%, okay? You can see that here. This is normal 13, distal, no proximal. You remove this TAD. Of course, you lose expression in distal cells because you remove the, the, the distal enhancers, okay? But you gain a little bit of expression in proximal cells, 15%, okay? That is enough to induce a mesomelic dysplasia. Okay? The mouse. It's not a severe mesomelic dysplasia, but it's a significant mesomelic dysplasia. Okay? Now look. This is a very weak gain of function. It's very, very weak. It's 15%. And that shows you how tight the boundary must be if you get a little bit of leakage in this wall, if 13 can be contacted a little bit by these enhancers, it makes the mess. So you cannot afford this. You really need to be very tight. Okay? Um, with this, I'd like to give you my conclusion. And the conclusion is that um, why, why to bother evolving such a complex system? You have 13, that is a poison. 13 is a poison. Why not take 13 in evolution and send it somewhere else? It's been done over and over again in our genome, as you know. If you don't want two things to be close to one another, you just put them on different chromosomes or you, know, you send them megabase away and it's done routinely in, uh, in our evolution. Why to keep such a risk very close to a, a part of the genome where you don't want it to be? But the, the answer is that, of course it's a poison, but it's a necessary poison because at some point you want to stop the system so 13 has to be part of this system because at some point you need to interrupt the system. You need to put digits 
you need to stop your intestine, you need to stop, you know, the axes. But you don't want to stop them too early. So this is the balance. This is the trade-off. It's a bimodal regulation that has evolved to make this trade-off possible. Yes, I'm, I, I'm having a poison on the back, okay? And I'm trying to make my, my body rapidly before these poisons come. In some animals, it comes early. In birds, for example, it comes early because the, okay. In snakes, it, it's kept silent for a long time. You know, the snake can make 350 vertebrae before it stops. In our case, it's somewhere in between. Okay, so you need to keep your enemy under control. You need to treat him well, but with a very tight border. Okay, with this I'd like to finish. I should say that the work I showed is mostly the work of um, Leonardo Beccari, Chase Bolt, uh, Edgardo Rodriguez Carvalho, who are postdocs in the lab, and then Fabrice Darbelet, who is a pre-doctoral student in the lab. And I should mention um, Benedict Mascrez, uh, who takes care of our mouse, Lucille De Lille, Anouk Nexuela, and Marion Leleu, who are very helpful for the bioinformatic um, aspect. Thank you very much. <laughs>